Holy, I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our show today, U.S. banks are in serious trouble. And just two days ago, I warned you about the Asian liquidity crisis and how it could float cross shores and hit U.S. banks. Well, it's here, and we're now seeing U.S. banks scrambling as the initial phases of a massive liquidity crisis start to hit bank balance sheets. But that's not the only problem that's facing banks and consumers as you're about to see things for the u.s banks are going to get far worse very quickly now let's head over to bank of america global research we picked today's story up with a u.s rates watch as they say that large cash drain on an overlooked driver of funding spike and this is a big issue because when the banks have a problem we see a spike in funding this is exactly what we saw in asia again we warned you this could hit american banks two days later we're already seeing signs of it as investors keep asking about about last week's U.S. Treasury funding spike. We initially overlooked one key factor, large reserve drain into the third quarter end, and we're gonna expand on the drivers and implications of large cash drain. Here's the hot take, the federal home loan bank issuing becomes relevant again, and this is a shocking move because what happened with Asian banks? They started running out of money, which is exactly what happens when financial conditions tighten, Then this always occurs when central bankers invert yield curves and money curves now one of the challenges it hasn't really impacted the u.s financial system and many people thought these curve inversions were irrelevant we warned you they were still relevant due to all the pandemic stimulus and was only a matter of time well it's here and instead of going to the discount window at the fed which is what asian banks did going to their central bank counterpart they went to the federal home loan bank this is something congress doesn't want something the fed doesn't want but the stigma of going to the fed is such a negative that the banks don't want you to know they're facing a massive liquidity crisis quarter trillions of dollar reserves matter since the first half of September at least 260 billion of reserves are drained out of the U.S. banking system as cash left the system repo spike we'll talk about what repo is in a little bit the cash drain was a result of at least three factors higher treasury general account lower bank term funding program and Q3 window dressing and this is a big issue because just like we saw with Asian banks money is leaving and is not being refilled and this is something we go back of course to when we saw the last banking crisis in March, what happened? The banks were running out of money. The Fed ran to the rescue and said, look, everything's okay. We'll inject money into the system. And we said, it's only a band-aid to the bigger issue here. It will be back. It's here now. As we see higher treasury general account, which increased from mid to late September. And what this did is it pulls money out of the banking system because when the government borrows, well, the banks actually take a lot of these loans and then eventually resell that debt on the open market well what this does is it pulls cash out of the financial system puts it in the coffers of the treasury this again by nearly 200 billion and recall for every one dollar in tga increase either reserves or overnight reverse repo typically declines by a dollar so this is dangerous this is a direct drain on reserves how about lower bank term funding program this was a bailout program back in march of last year usage of this surprisingly dropped 26 billion we'll show you why this this is because one of the things we weren't expecting is the banks to run to the federal home loan bank and we see debt issuing jump likely with higher advances to repay those loans. And this increased federal home loan bank debt is exactly due to upper pressure on the federal funds rate. But let's talk about window dressing here because dealer repo activity likely declined into the third quarter due to balance sheet pressures consistent with overnight reverse repo jump. Commercial banks may not have as much flexibility to invest cash into repo because of reporting constraints. So we have multiple issues here as banks are seeking collateral. They're in desperate need of cheaper cash as they turn to the federal home loan bank and on top of that the government is borrowing big numbers pulling liquidity out of the system and this is all a dangerous cocktail as b of a warns that this is heading us right into a massive liquidity crisis one that looked like just what happened in 2019 if you look back what happened then, of course, the Fed reacted very quickly by aggressively cutting rates, something they can't get away with now, but they also did quantitative easing, something nobody thinks they're going to do. But if we hit a liquidity crisis, watch the Fed go below.
ballistic. And here you can see the Treasury General account increasing from mid to late September, pulling nearly $200 billion out of the financial system of desperately needed cash. And now that's sitting in government coffers waiting to be spent. But how about we turn to the bank term funding program? Now you'll note this is a one year loan. And what we expected was a payback to be exact mirror of, of course all the borrowing because it was a one year loan and the banks have really no incentive to pay it off early. But suddenly they're doing that. And the reason has everything to do with a bank term funding program interest rate, which is stuck way up here as one year overnight spreads continue to fall, meaning banks have every incentive to refi this debt. Now the original plan plan was when the Fed implemented this program is that money would flow back into the banks, mostly this being the small and mid-sized regional banks that are starved for cash. And what would happen then is they would eventually attract this money back in and be able to pay this debt off. But what's happened is they're not attracting money. That's the issue because the federal funds rate is too high. Short-term rates such as CDs and other products are too high and the banks just don't have the capacity to match those returns. We're seeing money again again, drain out of the financial system, out of the critical small and mid-sized regional banks. They're so desperate that they're turning to the federal home loan bank. Again, this is something Congress doesn't want, the Fed didn't want. In fact, the Fed doesn't want this so badly. They've come out with a marketing campaign to tell the banks it's okay to go to the discount window, but the stigma of going to the Fed for money is such a negative. The last place the banks want to go is to the Fed. And here we can see right around the time they started paying down those bank term funding programs, we see federal home loan bank issuance of debt rising because the interest rate is lower here. The banks are in danger in a big way. And we have long believed funding markets are determined by three fundamentals, cash, collateral, and dealer sheet capacity. We attributed last week's funding spike to the latter two factors. We overlooked the extent of cash draining contributing to the pressure. So what we have is tight financial conditions draining money from the system because there isn't enough new money being created to pay on all the debts and to achieve the growth targets of the economy, but we're also seeing a collateral shortage. And this is important because in normal times, there's ample amounts of collateral, it's not an issue. But as financial conditions tighten, banks start to get worried, they start wanting more capital, and what they need is, of course, treasury bills. That is what's considered the most pristine collateral. We're going to talk more about that here in a little bit because I want you to understand what's going on is what we're seeing is reserve balances are projected to get worse. And this is dangerous because the Fed really doesn't want to see bank reserves get a whole lot lower. They've kind of mentioned that in their press conferences that they're happy with the level of reserves because if they get lower, what that means is the Fed's going to have to lower interest rates and go back to quantitative easing because what QE does is it forces the creation of bank reserves, and that means interest rates are likely broadly going to plummet. But the issue is in the short term, we've seen interest rates rise. But one thing that should be rising in a big way, that is your trading account. Let's update you on our uranium trade. Now, how did we know this was going to be a huge success? Because we back tested our reports. Now, this is our CTA Timer Pro that trades against the machines. When the machines get in deep short positions and price rallies against them, well, not only do we run a historical overlay to show you how to beat the machines, but we back tested. We said right here, this was a high probability trade. It's so high probability that not even a month later, you're up 14%. And I think this thing's going a whole lot higher. But we have two reports. One of them, we trade against the machines. We're seeing on two open trades. That's a 100% win rate. How about Momentum Timer Pro? We're seeing on four open trades. Three of them are now up. That's a 75% win rate. We added two trades today. And this is how easy it is, my friends. We had two trades trades today for our subscribers, they're both up. So that is huge. You can make money trading in a big way. You get the daily reports. In fact, Momentum Time Pro is only 20 bucks a month. You can easily make that back trading. You get the tradable signals. I tell you which trades you should do. We give you back test data. We got that coming on Momentum Timer Pro that proves our signals work. We have stop loss levels. We fully track all our trades and returns. We give you a weekly update on our stop loss levels, fully duplicated. 30 day free trial. You know, my buddies don't do that because they know you won't make money trading their system. We do. We want you to get in and start making money and then you'll understand. Because let's talk about reserves and what happens here when financial conditions tighten, money gets drained from the system. So let's go back to the global financial crisis and see what happened. 
So on this chart, we're looking at the net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans as shown in blue. And what happens is any time that blue line is above that horizontal black line, well, it means financial conditions are tightening. Now here you see reserves and depository institutions skyrocketed. Now this was due to quantitative easing one. It really wasn't an evidence of money being drained out of the system. But look what happens as the Fed ends its QE program. You see what happens, reserves start to get drained. And even though financial conditions eased a little bit, they were still fairly tight. Not enough money was being created. And you see money getting drained out of the system. And then what happens? The pandemic hits. Massive amounts of money are borrowed, injected into the financial system. But look what happens now. You see financial conditions tightening. It really isn't affecting the broad economy at this point, although it's just starting to. But look at the banks. You see reserves getting drained down. And then they come back a little bit. And now they're getting drained again. This is a dangerous sign for the banks because what it's indicating is there's a liquidity crisis coming. And remember, we talked about this in the show the other day, that those very short-term rates spike, those interbank rates spike when you have liquidity problems. Well, guess what? Bank of America says that's about to happen as repo is the heart of markets. Now, you might wonder is what is repo? Now, when my buddy Jay Bravo calls me and asks me questions, he says, Steve, can you explain things as a third grader? Well, JB, this ex explanation is for you. So let's pretend we're a third grader and we're in class and the school says, hey, we've got to issue a textbook. Me, every third grader needs a textbook. So we'll call that collateral is what that textbook is. But let's say there's a problem and under normal conditions, each student would have its own book. And that way, if there was something wrong, they would have, well, they'd have the collateral they need. But let's say there's a mirror class and there's only one book for the entire class. So how do they meet the requirements of having collateral? Well, the first student with the book says, you know what? I don't really need this all the time, so I'll loan it to the student behind me at their desk and I'll charge them interest. And then that student says, well, I don't need it every day either. So they're gonna loan it to the next student. And next thing you know, there are lending agreements to every student in that class. And yet when a regular looks at it, it doesn't matter if every student has the own book or every student's borrowed a book, when the feds come in and audit the banks, they say, oh, everybody's got collateral. But there's a problem. When things start to go wrong in the system, those who have borrowed it, well, or lent it out, that is, they want it back. And so they say, hey, we're gonna do a margin call. We want our money here because we wanna hold collateral in case something goes wrong. And next thing you know, there's a scramble by all these banks that don't actually have collateral. That's why you see funding rates spike. That's why you're seeing this issue in the repo market. It's telling you financial conditions are tightening because because what you don't know about the US banking system is they're not required to actually hold the collateral until they actually need it. And then the banks scramble in a big way. It's a big problem with our system. And here we can see that repo EKG flags a shift as cash train is supported a spike in the repo rate. And Fed should take repo pulse and sense the shift. If the Fed is too late to diagnose, we get a 2019 repeat. The bottom line, stay short on spreads with Fed behind on the diagnosis. And here you can see, looking back to the sofa, less the IBOR spread, going back into 2019, what happened? It spiked. And yes, for those who remember those events of September, a similar dynamic was seen back in September of 2019. At that time, the correlation of changes in reserves turned similarly and culminated with the Fed's not QE with the last few months before COVID mysteriously emerged sparked the biggest liquidity injection in history. Here, we're now seeing the setup. You see this again from Bank of America Global Research. But similar, but not identical, because this time, in addition to the three trillion in reserves, there's also the 300 billion liquidity backstop that was reverse repo facility. However, between QT and the coming treasury interest onslaught, that it's just a matter of time before reverse repo is drained and total reserves slip back to the three trillion, which at point it'll be time to start front running the next Fed panic, which we know is coming. But as we started the show out, there's issues, not just with the liquidity, the underlying plumbing of the financial system. We're now seeing problems with the banks and consumers that are only going to make this liquidity problem worse. Let's turn to JP Morgan, who post their earnings today was a surprise gain in net interest income, which raises key revenue view, but it's really the underneath that matters here because the firm's results included 3.11 billion provision for loan losses and 2.09 billion in net charge-offs, amounting to roughly 1 billion in reserve bill. 
Now, what this means is when they have loan losses or they build their reserve for loan losses, they're projecting people that are going delinquent or are not going to be able to pay their loans. They're going to have to write that loss off. That's not a sign of a booming economy because what you want to see here is loan loss reserves go down as more and more people lend, which would give you some indication that the liquidity crisis is going to go away because new money is being created. What we're seeing here is further signs at the consumer level and at the banking level that the liquidity crisis is getting worse because people are running out of money. And most of the reserve bill was tied to the consumer unit, primarily credit cards, as period in card services loan grew 12% a year ago. And what that means is we start to see the delinquency rate rising, which is something we've warned about. And is again, evidence that there's not enough money in the system. As we go back to the net percentage of the makes tightening standards for commercial industrial loans against the delinquency rate for credit cards, that's shown in red. And what do we see here? As banks tighten lending standards, eventually the money drains from the system. System. You see there's not enough money to pay on all the debts. Delinquency rate rises here going into the dot-com bubble. We see it happen again going into the global financial crisis, and we see it happen again. Now, mind you, it's still very low levels, and this data is only updated quarterly. But nevertheless, the direction here and what J.P. Morgan's signaling is absolutely dangerous because now we turn to the U.S. consumer as sentiment unexpectedly falls on high cost of living. And what we know is when cost of living goes up, consumer spend less, they borrow less, less money is created in the system. And what you can see is the brewing of an imminent liquidity crisis centered right at U.S. banks. Of course, the only bailout will be the Fed. The question is, as BFA notes, it'll be too little and likely too late. As a preliminary October sentiment index declined to 68.9, something we believed was likely going to happen from 70.1 in September. And when we look at sentiment against delinquency rates, well, it's notable. We see back here in the mid 90s, the economy was actually fairly decent, but not for everyone. You see delinquency rate rising, sentiment flatline. But now we move into again to 2000. What do we see? Sentiment comes down as the delinquency rate rises. Consumers realizes the party is over. Again, it happens once again going to the global financial crisis. But this time we see something different. We see sentiment rising as consumers remain very optimistic about the economy at the same time they're struggling to pay their bills we believe the sentiment is going to come crumbling down as the delinquency rate skyrockets now of course we know this has everything to do with the labor market and our question of the accuracy of the data of the labor market but we look at continued unemployment claims against consumer sentiment what we're seeing in the delinquency rate is consumers losing their job unable to pay their bills. And what this is telling us is consumers are starting to get worried about the economy. Now they're not saying it, but we can see the relationship here between a plunge in sentiment and a rise in unemployment in terms of continued claims. And while the rate of inflation has cooled over the past year, households remain troubled by high prices as they also see outpacing their income gains for the year ahead. And that means of course, less spending. That's a real issue here. A measure of consumers perception of the current financial conditions dropped to the lowest level since the end of 2022. But get this, despite the fact that they're looking spending less and they're worried about their finances, the share of consumers who expect unemployment to rise in the coming year fell to 31%, which means they actually think the labor market's gonna hold up. But remember, your spending is someone else's job. At some point, they're going to lose confidence in the labor market as well. And yet, respondents welcome the Federal Reserve's decision last month to start lowering borrowing costs. Their views of buying conditions for durable goods such as cars and major appliances edged up to a four-month high. So notably, they're worried about their finances, but for some reason, they think, well, I might be able to go afford things. The reality is they're not, and that's the issue. They just don't realize they don't have the money. But looking about creating large amounts of money for the economy, but let's talk about home buying conditions as concerns about high interest rates fell to the lowest in 15 months, but a majority still still sees borrowing costs is too high, suggesting further easing is necessary to bolster sales. When that means is builders are gonna be stuck with inventory, banks aren't gonna be lending and creating money. And if all you see is everything kind of slowly moving into what's going to be a massive liquidity crisis that we're already starting to see in the repo market. My friends, this is not a good sign for the US banks. It's not a good sign what we saw the last two days for Asian banks or the global economy. It says we're headed to an absolute financial crisis. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.